Hi everyone and welcome to Scholar Sus. Today we're going to do something a little bit fun. Alan Becker recently put out a video called Animation versus Geometry. And since I'm a mathematician and differential geometer, I thought it'd be kind of fun to react to it. Uh, and so I haven't seen it yet. This is the first time I'm going to watch it. We're just going to react together and see what happens. Got a nice little circle. Got a, a guy pulling himself out of a line. Checking out a line segment. Point called A. That's nice. And B over there. I really like some of his stuff that does this, where it kind of messes with the way we notate it. You can like sometimes turn it on and off. It's pretty cool. Oh, here's another. Ooh, that's a ray. Pretty nice. Oh, see the direction of the ray can change. Oh, that's cool. Measures it with the angles. Like how it has the vertical angles there that are the same. Well, that's the right angle to get. Those are linear pair, add to 180. So the linear pair that we just saw that adds to 180 because they're right next to each other between a ray and a line. Two angles adding up to 180 are sometimes called supplementary angles. So here's my question for you. Why can't uh, two congruent supplementary angles ever win an argument? Because they're both right. Yeah, I'll just take play again. So now here it's looking at the ratio from A to B, and there's a bright light here at the golden ratio. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, phi is usually what we use to refer to the golden angle, That's, or golden ratio. That's pretty cool. The golden ratio is an interesting ratio in mathematics. It comes up in all sorts of contexts. The definition of the golden ratio is that it's the positive ratio phi such that phi equals 1 plus 1 over phi. You can solve this equation for phi in a pretty straightforward way by first multiplying by phi and then solving the resulting quadratic equation phi squared equals phi plus 1, or phi squared minus phi minus 1 equals 0. Using the quadratic formula, you can solve this to get phi equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. We want the positive root, and square root of 5 is greater than 1, so thus the golden ratio becomes the number phi equals 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. Now, one of the most commonly known places where the golden ratio comes up is with a golden rectangle. This is a rectangle where the ratio from one side to the other is the golden ratio. If you cut that into a square and another rectangle, the resulting rectangle is another golden rectangle. To see why, set the side length of the square to be A and the short side of the smaller rectangle to be B, so that the long side of the big rectangle is the length A plus B. Then the fact that both rectangles have the same ratio of sides is the equation a over b equals a plus b over a, which is the same as 1 plus b over a. If we call the ratio a over b just x, then this is rewritten as x equals 1 plus 1 over x, which is the defining equation for the golden ratio. Thus, the only way for, the, for a rectangle to have this property is if the ratio of the sides is, in fact, the golden ratio. But this means that we can cut the next rectangle into a square and a rectangle and get another golden rectangle. And then we can do it again and again an unlimited number of times. And in each of the squares, we draw a quarter circle arc from one corner to its diagonal opposite. We get a spiraling curve that very closely approximates a golden spiral. Specifically, if we set A equal to 1, then the spiral generated by this rectangle closely approximates the golden spiral given by the polar equation R equals phi to the 2 theta over pi. Pretty crazy. Let's get back to the video. If we can get up there and push the golden ratio back. Thirty, sixty, ninety triangle. Oh, so he's gonna just have the golden ratio as a companion. That's fun. Or an antagonist, I don't know. Doesn't want to get caught. And now we have another rectangle. Ooh, look at that. 
90 degrees. Now it's a parallelogram. Why is moving quick through this stuff? And the diagonal. Ooh, pentagon. Hexagon. These are all regular shapes. Look at that. Keep getting more and more regular uh, sides, it ends up looking more and more like a circle. And now you have the golden ratio. Pretty nice. That's pretty cool. You put a square there, and that square's in the golden ratio shape, and you can start putting together like a, a rectangle that does it. Oh no, he's going with the Pythagorean Theorem. That's even, that's pretty cool too. There's so many different proofs of the Pythagorean Theorem. This is Euclid's original proof, which deals with cutting up the big square into two rectangles and then using triangles to show that the area of each rectangle is equal to the area of the corresponding smaller square, thus showing that the areas of the smaller squares add to the area of the larger one. This is a proof by American President James Garfield, which relies on the area formula of a trapezoid. And the sum of these three triangles equaled the area of the trapezoid, and simplifying the resulting algebraic equation results in the equation of the Pythagorean theorem. And this proof is one built out of negative space in a square. Both the left and right squares are identical, and they each have four copies of the right triangle with sides A, B, and C. Then the negative space in each big square has to have the same area. In one configuration, the negative space is clearly a squared plus b squared, and in the other, it's clearly c squared. This proof was perhaps first shown in a Chinese document from approximately 200 BC, but it was independently devised by Maurice Lanay, a high school boy in Indiana in 1939. One of the best parts about math is that there's so much to know and discover that people discover and rediscover facts all the time. All right, back to the video. There you go. Pretty cool. There's showing that the area can be put that way. So that's kind of a proof of the Pythagorean theorem where you adjust the size of the area by adjusting the, keeping the size of the area the same, but adjusting the shape. Oh, now we're going 3D. Got like a fractal on the background and it destroys the, the stuff. That's pretty cool. A fractal is a geometrical pattern that has detail at every scale. Usually this detail is similar or identical in pattern. An example is what's left over of after this giant 3D creature destroys this depiction of the Pythagorean theorem. What's left behind is called the Zerpiski carpet, and it's a fractal that pretty much looks the same at every possible scale. That is, no matter how much you zoom in on it, it looks the same. Curiously, this fractal has zero volume, but infinite surface area. There's some pretty awesome applications of fractals too, including a fractal antenna. This antenna is a fractal designed to maximize the perimeter of the antenna, but stay within a small surface area. By also using a self-repeating design over multiple levels, it creates an ability for the antenna to operate at multiple frequencies at the same time. This is particularly useful in cell phone communications. Can't get that ray and get out of there. See, wouldn't it be better if math classes were like this, right? You know, super high adventure while you try to learn about math. It's like in the spirit of uh, Donald Duck and Math and Magic Land, that's, that's way more fun. Whoa, wait, did you see that? Let's back up. The arrows that the golden ratio produced for the guy are built out of a continued fraction. This fraction is pretty interesting as it's another representation of the golden ratio. Remember the golden ratio was the number that was defined as phi equals one plus one over phi? Well, if we keep replacing phi with its definition, we can get the following chain. Phi equals 1 plus 1 over phi, which equals 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over phi, which equals 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over phi, which equals 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over phi, which equals 1 plus 1 over, well, you get the idea, which is precisely what the golden ratio character produced for the guy. It's just another subtle and perfectly placed reference to the golden ratio, but in a blink and you'll miss it moment. A little more exciting. Oh, look at that. There's this Fibonacci spiral. Keeps going to golden ratio and then turning each time he does one. These are all quarter circles that go through 
these points. And if uh, rectangles in the golden ratio, you kind of do that forever. What's he being chased by? Oh, that's fun. So what he drew there, uh, I'm going to step back just a tiny bit. Okay, so he's going to draw something to get away here. The funny thing about this, so he uses this hang glider. Now this hang glider is a is, is built out of a shape called a dart, which has two uh, sets of adjacent congruent sides. Uh, you can also, if it's non-convex, it's called a dart. If it's convex, then it's called a kite, which could have been kind of funny, but uh, but he goes, but this looks more like a hang glider, so that's why he's using it. But it's pretty cool. He's darting away with it. There you go. Oh, it's shooting. What, like little diamonds at him? Looks like 3D diamonds. Oh, there's a, there was a kite for a minute. Good thing he found this golden ratio floating around. He'd have been toast otherwise. Beautiful star. Golden ratios everywhere. Look at that. Golden ratio rectangles. We got... Destroying everything with the golden ratio. I gotta love it. Ooh. He's gonna try to turn it into 3D and shrink it down to a point. That's what it looked like he did with the spear. There you go. Now he's got it in 3D. That's awesome. This is a three-dimensional thing, even though it's drawn like a 2D one. You know, it's drawn like it's in 2D, like you'd have to on a picture, on like a. Uh, whiteboard or something like that but he's got him trapped because it's a 3d I think that's kind of that's kind of neat how in a, if you're a 2d uh, character how do you affect three dimensions this reminds me of an interesting story called flatland by a square actually it's by edwin abbott but it's about a square living in two dimensions that dreams of the third dimension and struggles to convince others in his flat 2d world that there's a third dimension but to very little effect actually the book was a satire on victorian society and so even as a literary item had multiple dimensions Anyway, back to the bidding. Did he catch him? He caught him. Now he's got him in this cube there. That's a golden. Oh, look at that. Now it's a 3D coordinate plane. An icosahedron, I guess. Wow! That was a quick run through of the platonic solids. Did you see it? There was a tetrahedron, an octahedron, a cube, and an icosahedron. The only one missing is the dodecahedron, and he'll have all five. The platonic solids are the only convex regular polyhedra. A regular polyhedron is one that has congruent regular polygons as all of its faces. And while it's surprising that there are only five of these, it's not really that hard to show. The regular polygon faces have to meet at common corners. And if the shape were completely flat, then the angles of these polygons would have to add to 360 degrees. However, since the shape is convex, that the angles at each corner have to add to less than 360 degrees. You can also see that there must be at least three polygons at each common corner or the polygon won't make a convex shape. The interior angles of a regular polygon with n sides can be shown to be 180 degrees minus 360 divided by n. Thus, an equilateral triangle has 60 degree interior angles. Squares have 90 degree interior angles. Regular pentagons have 108 degree interior angles. Regular hexagons have 120 degree interior angles, and the angle measures just continue to go up from there, but never getting bigger than 180 degrees. Since there have to be at least three regular polygons at each corner, and the angle sum of the angles at the corner has to add to less than 360 degrees, we can immediately see that any regular polygon with six or more sides can't possibly create a convex regular polyhedra. Three regular pentagons at a corner would add to 324 degrees, so that would work. 
but four would not because it adds to 432 degrees. Thus, there is only one type of convex regular polyhedron with regular pentagonal faces, and that's the dodecahedron. Three squares at a corner would add to 270 degrees, so that would work, but four would add to exactly 360 degrees, and so would not work. Thus, there is only one type of convex regular polyhedron with square faces, that's the cube. Three equilateral triangles at a corner would add to 180 degrees, which works. Four triangles would add to 240 degrees, which also works. And five triangles would add to 300 degrees, and so would also work. Finally, six triangles and above would not work because six triangles would add to exactly 360 degrees. Thus, there are three types of convex regular polyhedra with equilateral triangular faces. And these are the tetrahedron, the three triangle case, the octahedron, which is the four triangle case, and the icosahedron, which is the five triangle case. Those are the only possible convex regular polyhedra, which we call the platonic solids. Anyway, they've shown four out of the five in this video so far. Let's see if they can get the dodecahedron. Now he's trapped him in, the, in an icosahedron. Well, Stretch inside, it's going to stay that way, but. This golden ratio up to. Okay, another 3D thing. There's that dodecahedron. Oh, look at the fractal that he created. The border in the background here is similar to another really famous fractal, the Mandelbrot set. This is the set of all complex numbers C, such that the sequence ZK, where K goes from zero to infinity, with Z naught equaling zero and ZK equaling ZK minus one squared plus C, does not diverge to infinity. So any complex number C where that sequence does not diverge to infinity. Zooming in on this fractal is truly mesmerizing as the pattern repeats no matter how small a scale you use. It's pretty nuts. That's really cool. Like a prism. Or like one of those hollow mirrors things. All the different 3D shapes and geometry that you can make. Whoa, did you see that? In this increasing dimension thing, there was actually a 4D shape represented. Right here is a representation of the Tesseract. The Tesseract is the 4D unit hypercube. This representation is a 3D projection of the Tesseract performing a simple rotation. Pretty awesome that here we have the stick man looking at multiple dimensions and we finally break into 4D geometry. Well, howdy, partner. That was it. Wow, that's fantastic. How much fun is that? So many different uh, ideas that are in there. You got the, the golden ratio was, was falling around the whole time. You even saw a little Fibonacci spiral, which super fun messing around with some of the platonic solids we saw. Uh, it was just really fun. I, I love the idea of how he uh, trapped the, um, the 3D shape that he, was, that he was chasing and by drawing a 3D shape around it, uh, even though he's supposed to be like sort of living in 2D. Really, really clever. I love this Alan Becker stuff. He had a uh, animation versus mathematics uh, video a few months back. As a plug for my Scholar Sauce channel, while I may not have as cool an animation as Alan Becker all the time, we do talk about a ton of fun and engaging mathematics content on my channel and add a little humor and spice as we go along. So if you're if you're interested in that kind of stuff, please consider subscribing and liking this video. And we'd love to have you join the Scholar Sauce community. We're on a mission to get over a thousand subscribers right now, so we're just starting out. Uh, but we can make this channel big, but I can only do it with your guys' help. So we have a lot of great content on our channel, and I hope you'll check it out, including this video here about how classic JRPG world maps weren't actually spheres, or this video here about how mathematical induction can sometimes play tricks on your brain. And we'll see you next time on Scholar Sauce.